Good morning. It, it's not that every message isn't important. If they come from the Word of God, they are. But I believe that for the next several weeks, the subject matter we're going to be looking at is of a level of import that it demands a, uh, an initial prayer as we go into it. Uh, for two reasons. Number one, asking that God would uh, open hearts and eyes and ears and hearts. Or I already said hearts, so I said hearts twice. But opening these things to be able to receive the message, primarily. And then the second reason is, <clears throat> um, I, I do some, when I, when I develop my messages, as I, you know, I study all week, and I will typically do some preaching of it when I'm by myself. Um, I hope nobody ever comes up here when I'm preaching to an empty audience. But some of the, you know, if I have a message planned out, usually the best preaching that I do is when nobody's here. And then in the, uh, and then it never comes out the way that it did when I was doing it by myself. I say that somewhat humorously, but I do want to ask the blessing of God as I speak these things because God has given to us eternal truths that are of, that are of a substance and a value that sometimes it's hard to comprehend. They're incredibly hard to relay and to, to illustrate and to give in a meaningful way. It's a constant challenge, um, and I don't want the Word of God at all to be hindered by the messenger. It's, it's like it's being funneled through, and you know, if there's any clogging in the ducts, I uh, want that to be uh, cleared out. Um, so let's, let's ask the blessing of God as we go into these messages. Please pray with me. Father, we enter into your presence, and God, we lift your name on high. You are awesome. You are the creator of the universe. You are the sustainer of all things. You give us life. You wake us each day. You bring us back into a state of consciousness. Father, you have given us the words of life. You gave them in your Bible. You passed them on through your son, Jesus. And we're coming at them. And <clears throat> God, we have... We have uh, all sorts of obstacles and, and things that would hinder us from being able to fully come face to face with the glory that is being shown to us. And my prayer this morning as we go into this message and the messages for the next several weeks is that, first of all, God, you would open the hearts and the eyes and the ears of each member in here. Let them be open and receptive like the good soil to just take in the word, to let it settle in there and to to grow and take root and and produce ultimately the fruit of the spirit of God. That's my first prayer and father my second prayer is that you would make it such that I am not at all a hindrance to these eternal truths that you are trying to convey to your people. Father, I pray that you would bless my mouth to be able to speak these oracles and I pray that uh, there would be uh, no, no lack of power due to my uh, inabilities as a human being. Father, we love you. You are awesome. Please bless us this morning. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. So the subject matter, we're in Romans chapter 4. And the subject matter for this morning, as well as the next three, four weeks, I don't know exactly how many it's going to be, is if, if you were to, to, to give it a topical name, it would be faith. But there are going to be so many facets and elements of it that, you know, I, I don't want to just simplify it uh, uh, to one word. But really what we're after here is, is learning how to effectively live the Christian life. Because, you know, if you've been a Christian for any period of time at all, and you've had these, this experience of the struggle of the flesh, and, you know, the difficulty it is to, to accept something with your mind, you know, with the intellect, to, to give assent to an idea, to say, I, you know, I believe that's true, but then, you know, to make that 
the rubber meet the road to make it take root, to, to bring it about in your life, is another thing. You know, it seems to me that we can recognize the truth in something, but there's always these things that would hinder it from coming about actually in our lives. You know, at the beginning of a year, we always have these ideas of things that we want to do to change our life for the better that year, a resolution of sorts. And, you know, so we see the value in it enough to say at the beginning of the year, this is what I'm doing going forward. But what happens? Something happens to where it, it actually doesn't happen. And, you know, I, I hope we can all appreciate that struggle that's there. And it is my conviction this morning that if we can grasp the elements of faith that are being presented in Romans chapter 4 over these next several weeks, we are going to have the course of our lives changed uh, forever, um, resulting in eternal salvation, resulting in the greatest hope that you can fathom, resulting in the greatest peace you've ever experienced, and resulting truly in the highest joy, and that is irrespective of the, the uh, superficial and temporary circumstances that we're also experiencing uh, simultaneous to this. A joy that is so deeply rooted that it doesn't really matter what's happening around us in, a, uh, in an immediate superficial sense, whether it's a physical health struggle or uh, you know, a struggle with family or a struggle with, with the nation or unrest, it doesn't matter. There is a way to have a, a joy within it that uh, transcends all of it. And I do believe that sort of the, um, the means to that end is faith and understanding what faith is. I think that we have not done a very good job teaching in the church what it means to have a biblical faith. And I'm not speaking specifically of this church. I'm speaking of the church in its broadest sense. We have not done a good job passing on and teaching what it means to truly legitimately believe in God. We have taken Western 21st century definitions of faith and imposed them on the Bible and made, you know, made people to see faith as sort of this you know, all it is is, well, I believe God exists or whatever. And, and when that didn't work, you know, the Bible is, is filled with have faith in God and it will be sorted out. Have faith in God and you will live righteously. Have faith in God, you'll overcome, uh, you know, these, these sins and these struggles that you're facing. We're, the Bible's full of that. And, and we, so we recognize and we accept that. But then we've got this definition of faith that isn't a biblical definition of faith. And then you take it and you work it into those verses and you say, you know, something's going on here because when I take this, this definition of faith and I apply it to this verse that I accept and believe with my heart, it actually doesn't bring about any real change. So something's wrong here. And then what we did as a result of there being no absolute change that came through that, we said, well, it's actually faith plus works. We separated the two as if there's a difference between them, as if faith is something over here and then works is something over here. We say you believe in your heart here, but then you just got to go work over here. When the biblical mode, and you're going to see this as we go through Romans 4, and if you pay any attention to the rest of the Bible, when you have the, the biblical definition of faith, Works are merely the fruit of it. It is not a separate thing. It isn't something you have to go work by your own might at and have faith over here. It's actually faith is in here. And when it's in here in the biblical sense, we're going to see in this man called Abraham, it will work out in my life to, uh, to righteous conduct, to overcoming the struggles of the flesh. And it's, uh, it's really amazing. Kind of a, um, a, a basic illustration of how I conceive of this. What if you were to trust in God in, in the same way that you are trusting in the pew underneath your rear? I just realized I said pew and rear in the same, <laughs> same sentence. Okay, 
So what if you were to trust in God in the same way that you have trust in that pew you're sitting on? Well, you probably, I mean, until I said that, it raised your hand if when you sat down in the pew, you questioned its integrity. Is there anybody in this room that as you walked in the room, you thought to yourself, I really hope that that seat supports me today? I don't see any hands. You didn't even think of it. You knew when you sat down, it's going to support me. Why? Because it's held up by glue and nails? Because the wood is still solid? I, I've got to say, the God that we serve, who made the world by a word of his power, is eternally more secure than wood and glue and nails. What if you were able to simply rest in God in the same way you can rest on a man-made structure? I believe that that's not only possible, but it is the biblical demand. And when that happens, faith is not something you're having to actively think about. It's just something you do. You move about as a, as a human being resting in, in the person of God, totally convinced that he's got your back. It does not matter what is happening anywhere. Do you have an impossibility before you? What does it matter? Do you have an obstacle of the flesh before you? So does everybody else. What does it matter? What is it that is before you that seems from our human, you know, we measure everything in terms of logistics and numbers and, you know, probabilities and all of that. That's fine in finance. That's fine in business models and structures. It is not fine in the household of God. It is not fine in our walk with God. We cannot measure things on that basis. We serve a God who, who doesn't have logistics. God prefers the logistics and the odds to be stacked against him so that he can show us how powerful he really is. How many times in the Bible do we got to read that? So my goal and and hopes through this message and the, the next several messages through Romans 4 is that this would establish us in our faith in God to bring about in a substantive, eternal uh, measure of change. And I truly believe that if you grasp these things, that is precisely what's going to happen. We can overcome anything through faith. Faith is like the, the conduit through which everything goes to bring about the change that God is, is trying to bring. Now this morning, <clears throat> um, I, this message is, you know, we are going to look at, we're going to look at Romans 4, pretty much 9 through 12, but I, I this is kind of a survey of Romans 4. I'm, I'm not saying that we're going to look real deeply at any particular part of it, but um, this is kind of something to establish us and get us on this road that we're going to be looking at for the next several weeks, just to establish some initial principles as we go into it. So this morning, all I'm going to do is, we're, these are the two parts of the message. We're going to look at the basis of my claim, and my, my claim is that faith is the key to successfully living everything God demands of us. Faith is, is it. Faith is the key. So that's my claim. So I want to look at the basis of that, which is actually established first in Romans 3, and then it's, it's uh, sort of broken open in chapter 4. Look at the basis of that, and then we're going to uh, look at how exactly that works with uh, um, what Paul's saying in Romans 9 through 12. So those are the two parts. Um, first of all, if you believe in God in the way that God would have you to believe, the way that it's actually presented in the Bible, not what you heard that faith is or what a you know, previous preacher told you that faith is or what you, you conceived that it was, what the Bible actually presents to us as faith, if you have that, it will bring all of the change in your life God's demanding. Here's the basis of that. 
First of all, I was trying to break open, you know, all of the areas of life that we endure, you know, all of this human experience, living, what is, what's all involved in it. And I think that in terms of, you know, how we navigate and move through life, there are two essential parts to it. The first part is all of the things over which I have been given jurisdiction and control. Uh, the second is all of the things that are completely outside of my jurisdiction and completely outside of my control. Those are the two parts. So God, as you know, as I was born into the world, there are things he gave me the ability to do. There are, I have jurisdiction over my body. I can tell my right hand, go over here. You know, it doesn't get to tell me, I can tell it to go over here. I can tell my left hand to go over here. I, I, to a degree, can <clears throat> uh, choose what I'm going to do and where I'm going to go and how I'm going to function. That's, that's what I've been given jurisdiction over. I have not been given any jurisdiction over any of you all. Um, I cannot, and, and you know, I want you to imagine the same for yourself and everybody else, we cannot you know, control or, or give jurisdiction uh, over anybody else. We, we do not have that. <clears throat> the, the two ways that I, kind of how I would conceive of this is you can be driving down the road and you can keep your car between the lines. You can do that. You can choose, I'm going to keep my, my hands at 10 and 2 and this car is going to stay between the lines. But you cannot control the person on the other side of the road who fell asleep or who was drunk or who, you know, um, was texting and, and swerved into your lane. You, you have control over your vessel, but not theirs. You can go down into your storm shelter and protect your, you and your family down there. You cannot prevent the tornado from going across your roof. Um, this is kind of the difference that I see between what we have control over and what we don't. Those are the two areas in functioning in life. We have a degree of control, but there's, there's not a lot. Now, concerning those two things, Paul establishes concerning both of those parts in Romans 3 and 4 that the key to successfully navigating it to eternal salvation, which is key, faith is the means to doing it. Concerning my vessel, concerning your vessel, I said a moment ago, we have jurisdiction over it. You've got control over it. Have you ever felt like, I'm not really controlling my body, my body's controlling me? Have you ever much control over it? Because, you know, as Paul established later on, and we're not going to take this out of context, we're going to look at it in context and see what his actual point was when we get there. But later in Romans, Paul says, speaking in general of the, the body and all that, he says, I do the very things I don't want to do and the very things I don't want to do, I keep on doing. Who will deliver me from, the, from this body of death? Now, as you keep reading, Paul's point was to say, there was a deliverance from this body of death and here's how. Um, he was not saying that that should be typical of the Christian walk, where your whole life, you keep on doing the very things you don't want to do and you don't do the things you want to do. His point wasn't saying that's how it should remain. He's saying this is how it is, and there is a way out of it. Well, that's, I think, the experience that we have. Look at what Paul says in Romans 3.31. He'd been making the case that the law is not going to make you righteous. Uh, you know, tacking on rules and regulations, imposing them to the body from the outside is not going to bring uh, change. It's not going to bring righteousness. He says the thing that's going to make you righteous actually is faith in God, a biblical faith in God. And he says in 331, after he'd said it, because there, you know, he, he, he was uh, expecting a rebuttal. He says, do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means, on the contrary, by this faith, we uphold the law. What is he saying? 
He's saying the standard, the rule, the code of conduct, the things God desires for you to be doing with your life and how you function, all of those things that up until this point have been impossible to you, and we have a whole Old Testament to prove that it was impossible for all those people too, he says the, the way to upholding the standard and the ethos of God is to have faith. That's what he's saying. He's saying the way to, to navigating is not by saying at the beginning of each day, here are my 60 rules, and you know I'm, I'm going to follow this rule and this one. When you do it that way, it's, of, it's of absolutely of no value. When you approach it from faith, which is internal and then moves outward, it brings the, the substantive change. And he mentions this over in Romans chapter 9, verses 30 through 32, when he's talking about the Gentiles. And he says the Gentiles obtained the righteousness of God because they had faith, whereas the Jews had a law that would lead to righteousness, but they never attained to righteousness because they approached it by the, on the basis of works rather than faith. What is he saying? He's saying the way to upholding the rule of God in your life is not rules. It's faith in God in the biblical sense which we're going to be looking at for several weeks to make sure we don't get off course on it, on exactly what that means. But um, this, is, this is what he says. Now, I do not have a... Maybe I can get one right here. I meant to grab my Bible out of my office. Um, if you don't mind, I'm going to go ahead and uh, pull up my Bible on my phone in the middle of the sermon. I'm going to scroll. I had this all... Uh, I had this passage that I wanted to read that was just going to be out of my Bible from Colossians chapter 2 and uh, uh, verse 20. Listen to this. Paul says, If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? He gives a, he explains what he means. He gives a quotation. Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. Why are you submitting to those kinds of regulations? Re referring to things that, that all perish as they are used, which are in accordance to, with, with human precepts and teachings. He says, these have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Okay, you're walking this Christian walk, you hear sermons, you say, I believe that sermon, you go out the door, you go do the very thing you've always done, you wonder why can't I overcome it? Probably because you came at it from do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. I made a post several weeks ago. It was actually a couple months ago. I was talking about lust, which is you know a very common problem in the human experience. It's one of the things the Bible talks about more than anything else in the New Testament because it's so incredibly common. Well, I made a, I wrote something about this, and somebody commented on my post on uh, Facebook, and they said. You know, they said, this is really simple. Because I was writing about how to overcome it. And he said, this is really simple. All, all you got to do is go to this website, download, download this accountability software, put it on your computer, and it's done. And I was thinking, no, that's, that is wrong in the deepest sense. That is not how you overcome the flesh. With a, with a new rule and... And, you know, software. The Spirit of God overcomes our flesh through software? I'm telling you what, you got software on your computer, there's still people out on the street. I mean, you, it doesn't matter where you go, there's opportunity for lust. It's everywhere. Software ain't the way to break it. But there is a way, and it is through faith. This is the message of the Bible. Continuously lean on God, look to God, watch God, keep your eyes up there. And 
don't even focus on the flesh. You will break through. That's the first part is your, you know, we have jurisdiction over this, but what about all the stuff we don't have jurisdiction over? Do We have jurisdiction to a degree over our bodies. What about somebody hitting us from the oncoming traffic and, and uh, you know, immobilizing us? We've got control over that. What about hidden diseases? You go in and the doctor says, you know, I, I've got some bad news. Um, we found a, a mass. We got any control over that? We got any control over a virus? We'd like to think we do. We got any control over our national politics? The key is more arguments on Facebook. That's how we're going to overcome it. Do we have any? Con There's so many things. Most of life's outside of control of, of each person. How do we navigate that successfully? Sure, so we come out on the other end, and it didn't derail us. And and spiritually speaking, we were made to be better, even through these things that happen that we don't have any control over. This is what Paul says in Romans chapter 4. He speaks of Abraham whose faith was in the God, here's a quote, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence things that do not exist. That's the God you serve. He can take a dead human and raise him up out of the grave and he did it he calls things into existence that do not even exist the the furthest impossibility to the person our god has jurisdiction and power over it there is nothing that stops the hand of god there is utterly no obstacle or logistical improbability or whatever you can fathom that can stop God in the mission that he has for your eternal life. If we could only see for a moment what he's got planned on the other side. Trials dark on every hand, we sing, and we cannot understand all the ways that God will lead us to the, the blessed promised land. We sing that song but we will understand it better by and by. God, it, having faith in the God who sees it all and is over all is the means to navigating all of the things we can't control. And in Hebrews 1 and verse 3, it says this of Jesus. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. You know what that means? You know, you got nails and glue that are holding the wood together. But who's holding those atoms together? Jesus is literally holding everything together by his word. If he were to say the word, it would all fall apart. That's the God. If you've got that God behind you and you trust in him, there is no... Nothing that will derail you. Now, <clears throat> look at verses 9 through 12. Let's read this briefly. Um, Paul says in verse 9, Is this blessing then only for the circumcised? This, this blessing that he'd said in 6 through 8. He spoke of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteous apart from his works. He said, Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven. Blessed are those whose sins have been covered up. We want our sins covered and we want our lawless deeds to be forgiven. And he said, is this blessing only for the circumcised? Is it only for the Jews or also for the uncircumcised? For we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? It wasn't after, but before he was circumcised. He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. 
He says the purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised so that righteousness would be counted to them as well and to make him the father of the circumcised who are not merely circumcised but who also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. That's a convoluted sentence or number of sentences. And, uh, but basically Paul's arguing that Gentiles have just as much of, of a right to salvation as Jews do. We have just as much of a right to salvation as Jews do. He says in 329, is God the God of Jews only? No, he's the God of Gentiles also. He said in 4.9, is this blessing only for the circumcised or also the uncircumcised? He said in 11, the purpose was to make Abraham the father of all who believe without being circumcised. So he's basically, this whole argument that he's making is to the Jew to say that you and I have every right to be in the eternal kingdom of God. But here's the catch. Because as, as I was going through it, I thought, how do you how do you transfer in an applicable way all this conversation about circumcision and uncircumcision and all that? We're so far removed from that, we can't even imagine that being a big deal. Uh, how do you translate that in a meaningful way? Paul's argument is this. He's, he's saying that there is a way to become a child of Abraham. And the way to become a child of Abraham, so that Abraham's your father, is through faith. Now, here's where you would ask, why does it, what's the big deal about being a child of Abraham? This is why it matters. Because about 4,000 years ago, God came to Abraham in Israel. And he said to Abraham, he said, in you, he said, get up, go from your kindred, go from your household, go to the land I'm going to show you. Abraham, Abraham went. And then God came to Abraham and he said, Abraham, in you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. God, God made a promise that there would be an enormous blessing that would happen in Abraham. Now, immediately, it was a little tiny seed whose name was Isaac. And Isaac went into his 90-year-old mother's womb, and she bore that baby. And Isaac had Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons. One of them was Judah. Judah had David. David, a long way down the line, had Jesus. Jesus was a son of Abraham by blood. Jesus came to bless the whole world. And God told Abraham, whoever blesses you, I will bless. The promise from the beginning of time, a promise God cannot break. God has to keep his promises once he makes them. You got to be in Abraham if you want to have the eternal blessings which were promised to Abraham. The only way, Paul says in Romans, 9 through 12, Romans 4, 9 through 12, to be in Abraham is to be a child of faith in the biblical sense, not in the... 21st century Western sense of faith. If we want these blessings that we've been talking about in Romans, the, the means to them is to truly believe as Abraham believed. And I, and I think that that's going to present a challenge because I think as we go through this, some of us are going to find, I haven't really believed. There was a point that I came to in my Christian walk where I realized, I don't think I actually really believe. I've been thinking that I did. I believe God is real. And I'm trying to follow these rules. But I'm not trusting in God the way I trust in a church pew. How, how can that be? How can my faith not be more in the God of the universe than in something I sit on? When a problem comes to me, I want to take it with my hands and control it and hold on to it. And do everything that I can with it. And I usually make a big mess. The Bible is teaching. Have faith. When we were living overseas in the Caribbean. There was a brother. Who uh, I ended up preaching his funeral. He was baptized shortly before we got there. And I spent almost five years. Um, going over to his house. 
uh, most weeks and sitting on his front porch and we feel that Cayman breeze blowing by us and we just look at the palm trees and watch the iguanas in his yard. And I cannot tell you how many times, this, this brother is 84 when he got baptized. And he'd had a lot of things go wrong in his life. Uh, hard life and, and, uh, and at this point in his life, a lot of things health-wise, all sorts of things. And I remember asking him, you know, what do you, how do you stay strong? How do you keep your composure? How do you keep this warm spirit that you always have? He's always, always uplifting. Did not matter what was happening. And he said, every time, keep faith. Those are the only two words he'd say. Keep faith. I remember there being a time in my life where somebody say that, I'd say, yeah, but, well, I got faith, but that's not actually doing it. The thing I'm learning is, no, I didn't really have faith. The kind of faith we're talking about here is how you get through those things. You will overcome everything. If God said, I want you to overcome this struggle of the flesh, you will overcome it by faith. If God said, I'm going to deliver you into the kingdom of my beloved son for eternal life, but you see all these things against you that would make it seem impossible, you better believe God is going to make it happen. Have faith. Trust in the name of the God we serve. He is far mightier than we can even fathom. Let's stand and sing.